It's good to see everyone this morning. We're very, very glad that you're with us. If you're visiting this morning, we want you to know that it's a joy and a delight to have you here. I hope that you took advantage of our Bible classes at 9 o'clock. If you didn't get to this time, please plan on doing that next time. And also, we hope that you'll come back this afternoon at 5 o'clock as we continue to look into God's Word and as we praise Him and worship Him in spirit and in truth. I'm going to begin in a little bit different fashion this morning than usual. Instead of beginning with Scripture, we're going to begin with a quote from an author, Mark Twain. And for those that know and love Jesse Beeson, I guess our late brother Jesse, this was one of his favorite authors. He loved the wisdom of Mark Twain. He appreciated the humor. And this quote captures both. Read this with me. April 1st is the day upon which we are reminded of what we are on the other 364. <laughs> You'll probably get that later. But we hope this does not reflect your situation today. But let me tell you this. Because of sin, and we've all sinned, Romans 3 and verse 23, we've all played the fool. That's what Mark Twain is talking about. We've all been there. 1 Samuel 26 and verse 21, Saul says, I have sinned, I have erred exceedingly, I have played the fool. Well, Saul, you're not alone. I have, and you have. And the Bible speaks of many fools. In Psalm 14 and verse 1, it speaks of the atheistic fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In Luke 12, verses 19 and 20, the materialistic fool. Remember the rich farmer? He said to himself, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said, you fool." Tonight, your soul will be required of you. Titus 3 and verse 3, Paul speaks of himself and others uh, as sensual fools. We've all sinned. That's his point. We've all been sensuous. He also, in Romans 1 and verse 22, speaks of intellectual fools. Professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools. But we don't have to stop there. We don't have to stay there. Notice this verse. In Ephesians 5 and verse 17, So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We don't have to continue being unwise in God's sight. We don't have to continue being foolish in His sight. And so let's remember that as we seek this morning to understand the will of the Lord. This morning, we're going to focus our attention upon the resurrected Lord. But this evening, we're going to focus our attention upon the resurrected life. We're talking about your life, my life. Hopefully, that's the way it is. If not, let me tell you something. Then we are being foolish. Very foolish. If we say this morning, I believe the Lord was raised from the dead, but you haven't been spiritually how foolish is that? You see, the resurrection of Jesus really has accomplished nothing as far as you're concerned. And so the first is so very important, but the second is also important. Have you taken advantage of the resurrection of Christ, the blessings that he has for you? And so let's think about this this morning by looking at Easter and the resurrection, just to begin with. Remember what we've already said, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Some people think that Easter, as they have come to know it, is the will of the Lord. Has to be because so many people talk about it, so many people celebrate it. Well, are these synonymous, Easter and the resurrection? And we're asking that biblically, not secularly, not what does the world think. 
But notice this, just in passing, consider this. This is important. If we don't want to be foolish, if we truly want to understand what the will of the Lord is, notice this. Easter is a tradition of man, whereas the resurrection is a doctrine of God. Man talks about Easter. God talks about the resurrection. Somebody says, now wait a minute, Kim. Have you not read Acts 12 and verse 4? And you'd have to read it in the King James. Because the King James is the only translation that mistranslates that verse. Yes, in the King James it talks about Easter. Try to find another translation that has Easter. None of them that I know of does. And the reason is because King James wanted it translated Easter. It is really what all the others translated Passover. Has nothing to do with the religious observance that we call Easter today. Easter, again, is a tradition of men. But the resurrection is a doctrine of God. Think about 2 Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 8, Paul says, Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. That was his preaching and teaching. That was our brethren's preaching and teaching in the first century. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. In Acts 23 and verse 8, the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection, nor in an angel, nor in a spirit. In Acts 26 and verse 8, Paul will ask the Jewish audience, why does it seem incredible to you if God raises someone from the dead? He's talking about Jesus. And he's saying to the Jews who believe that God created the earth, why does it seem incredible? You know this God, you know his power, his majesty, his might. Why does it seem so inconceivable, incredible, unthinkable? if he raises the dead. And of course, that's exactly what the teaching and preaching was in the first century. We've already mentioned in the scripture this morning, 1 Corinthians 15, verses three and four, Paul was delivering to them what was first delivered to him, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture. That's exactly what was delivered to Paul. That's exactly what he delivered to others. That biblical doctrine. In Acts 2 and verse 24, it was impossible for the grave to hold him. That's talking about Jesus. As Peter preaches, the grave couldn't contain him. Why? Hebrews 7 and verse 16, he had the power of an indestructible life. Revelation 1 and verse 18, Jesus said, I was alive and was dead, and now I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. And so the resurrection, make a distinction in your mind concerning the resurrection and Easter. Easter is a tradition of man. The resurrection is a doctrine of God. You remember Romans 1 and verse 4? It says, He, meaning Jesus, He was declared to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection. As the Father raised His Son, He proclaimed Him to be just that, with power through the resurrection. Again, in Romans 4 and verse 25, Jesus was delivered for our offenses. He was raised for our justification. We need to be thinking seriously about his resurrection. Not simply today, but every day of our lives. He was delivered because of our sins, our offenses. He was raised for our justification. And so notice, Easter is a tradition of man, whereas the resurrection is a doctrine of God. Notice this next point. Easter is a seasonal observance, one highly secularized and commercialized, whereas the resurrection of Christ is the spiritual foundation upon which Christianity rests. 
Do you notice that distinction? Easter, what is it? Well, it's a tradition of men. It's a seasonal observance. But the resurrection, it's the very foundation upon which everything else regarding Christ and Christianity rests. Let me read a couple of things that I jotted down here. And I think you'll find this true. No other single event in history has so much writing on it, so much depending upon it, as does the resurrection. You see, without the resurrection, every other Bible doctrine is without proper foundation. Nothing else that we teach rests on anything that's solid without the resurrection. Again, if Christ was not raised from the dead, then Christianity is built upon a lie. Did you hear that? Don't just listen to the last part, Christianity is built upon a lie. It's not. But again, it's one of those if then. If Christ was not raised from the dead, then Christianity was built upon a lie. That's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then he says, I'm a liar. Because that's exactly what I proclaimed to you. If Christ wasn't raised on the third day as the Bible teaches, then all of our Lord's promises are dead with him. They lie in the tomb with him. There's nothing to hope for in Christ if there is no resurrection. And thus, as we think about this, again, how important it is. The resurrection is either the Christian's Gibraltar or it is his Waterloo. There is no getting around that. It's either that solid foundation upon which we build our lives or if it's not true, we're building upon the sand. And notice this. Easter is a man-made holiday, whereas the resurrection of Christ is a God-wrought miracle. Some have called, and rightfully so, the resurrection, the crowning miracle of the Bible. I want to read just one verse and it's so interesting because this is what Paul says in Antioch in Pisidia. But as he's preaching concerning the Christ and his death and his burial and yes, his resurrection, as he brings his lesson to its climax, notice this, Acts 13 and verse 30. Listen to these seven words. This is the entire verse. Paul says, but God raised him from the dead. That whole verse speaking concerning Jesus and the resurrection and the fact that his father raised him, but God raised him from the dead. Remember, we've already mentioned Romans 1 and verse 4. He declared him to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection. Now, think with me for just a moment the evidence behind the resurrection. God has not ever asked us to believe anything without evidence. You know, when the world talks about the Christian and their, quote, blind faith, the Christian's faith is not blind. Not if it's biblical faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of the Lord, Romans 10 and verse 17. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. God has never asked us to believe anything without evidence. He's asked us to believe the resurrection. Why? Because he's given us ample evidence to support it. What's part of that evidence? Notice this. Documentary evidence. We're talking about the Bible. The New Testament document. Everything within it supports the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything within it suggests, implies, demands the resurrection of our Lord. Do you realize that Jesus taught that he would be raised? 
In John 2 and verse 19, he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Of course, the Jews were thinking physically, the earthly temple. Took our fathers 46 years. He was talking about the temple of his body, verse 21 says. And so Jesus anticipated a resurrection. Jesus knew why he came to this earth. In Matthew 16 and verse 21, the first time he begins to teach his disciples, we're going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be delivered over to the Jews. And again, they're going to deliver me to be crucified and I'll be raised on the third day. Jesus taught that. He understood that. He anticipated that. Again, we need to remember the documentary evidence. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up again. This commandment I received from the Father. John 10 and verse 18. And so everywhere when you look in the New Testament, you're going to read about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God has given us documentary evidence. But notice this. We have eyewitness evidence. And we're using this because... This evidence, documentary evidence, eyewitness evidence, it will stand up in any court of law even today. Again, the evidence is impressive. The evidence is overwhelming. The evidence is conclusive. If we're honest, if we are intelligent enough to read it and to understand it. Let me suggest something right now. Young people and those of us who are older, don't be bullied into unbelief. That's what the world wants to do. They want to laugh at you. They want to ridicule the scriptures. The scriptures have been doubted. The scriptures have been denied. The scriptures have been rejected, but they've never been discredited. They laugh, they mock, but once again, there's still this documentary evidence. There is still the eyewitness evidence Turn with me for just a moment to 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to notice in, in 1 Corinthians 15, you would do yourself a wonderful favor this afternoon just to read that entire chapter. That is Paul's resurrection chapter, if you will. But he's going to say, after he says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried, and was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, verse 4. Look what he says now. He gives eyewitness testimony, verse 5, and that he was seen by Cephas, here's Peter, seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. So they all saw him. Look at verse 6. And after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So Paul says, not just Cephas, not just Peter, and the rest, the 12, but over 500 at once, and many of them, he's saying, are still alive. They're still witness, they're still with us. And they still grant that eyewitness testimony. Look what he says in verse seven. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. I witness testimony. I witness evidence. Peter could say, I saw him. The 12 could say, we saw him. Over 500 could say, we also saw him. James can say, I saw him. Paul can say, I saw him. I know what I'm talking about. I saw him. And the empty tomb evidence. The empty tomb has been called the silent witness. But the silent witness speaks volumes. The silent witness, we're talking about the empty tomb. It speaks louder and it speaks with more authority than any argument unbelievers might set forth. The tomb is still empty. Again, all the world had to do in the first century, all they had to do to discredit the preaching and teaching of the apostles was to produce the body. And if they could have produced the body, they would have. 
that would have stopped Christianity in its tracks. It would have made the apostles the laughing stock of Jerusalem and all Galilee. But it didn't happen because the tomb was empty. And everyone involved knew that the tomb was empty. Listen to this quote. Read it with me. The resurrection could not have been maintained in Jerusalem for a single day, for a single hour, if the emptiness of the tomb hadn't been an established fact for all concerned. That's why they kept preaching and teaching. They couldn't produce the body, the world. They had seen the resurrected Christ. Again, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Remember this now. We're going to begin with this tonight. But it simply says the gospel of Jesus Christ is a story about our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. You know, in Colossians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 4 and following, we understand that, again, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not only the story about our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, but it's also the good news about our death, burial, and resurrection in Christ Jesus. Let's close with these thoughts. Those who are in Christ, you agree with what I'm saying here. Those who have never obeyed the gospel, I don't know your heart. I don't know your reasons. If you can't agree with these, I wish you'd study the scriptures more because then you would agree. Remember what we said, don't be bullied into unbelief. Don't let the world tell you that no one who is intelligent believes the Bible. Go back to Acts 13 and verse 7. Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, the Bible says, he sought to hear the word of God. And when he heard it, he obeyed it. Don't let the world bully you into unbelief. I didn't see Jesus when he tabernacled in the flesh, but I believe that he did. Why? Because of the evidence. It's compelling. It's overwhelming. If we're honest enough to read it and consider it. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 8, Peter is talking to second generation Christians. They, like we, did not see Jesus. But Peter says, although you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Just like them, that's what we do. We didn't see him either, but we believe in him. Why? The evidence is overwhelming. Number two, I didn't witness his death upon the cross, but I believe he was crucified for my sins. You know, Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2. And again, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. I didn't see the tomb where they placed him, but I believe he was buried. My God tells me so. The scriptures teach that. You know, at the end of Matthew 27, we find that he was laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And they saw where he was laid. I didn't, but I believe it. I didn't see him rise from the dead on the third day, but I believe that he did. Why? Because of what we talked about this morning. The documentary evidence, it's there, if you'll simply consider it. The eyewitness evidence you can believe because others saw him. That's what stands up in a court of law, eyewitnesses. And so once again, as we think about these things, the empty tomb witness, that evidence. If he wasn't raised from the dead, if somebody actually stole his body, remember that's the story that they said, you, you spread this story around, that the disciples came and stole his body. Why would men who really, if they stole his body, why would they lose their own lives? Why would they allow themselves to be killed for preaching something they knew was false? If they stole the body, they knew it wasn't true. 
And men don't lie so they can go to their death. These men would not recant the Christ nor his resurrection, even at the threat of death. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and because they did not love their life unto death. Revelation 12 and verse 11. Talking about our brethren in the first century who overcame Satan. Tonight, I hope you'll plan on coming back because as we've looked at the resurrected Lord, this should mean so much to us. But if it means anything to us, then our study tonight should be valuable. It should be indispensable because we're talking about the resurrected life. My life because of him. He died for me. He was buried. He raised. He was raised on my behalf. And because of that spiritually, I want to die to the old man, the old man of sin. I want to be buried with him in baptism. And I want to be raised in newness of life. To live as he lived. To walk as he walked. The resurrected life. We're going to be looking at the results of that resurrected life. And again, this afternoon, if you'll take time to read Colossians 3, verses 1 through 17, you'll see many of the results of that resurrected life. For those who are children of God this morning, have we been walking in newness of life? If not, shame on us. And if not, we need to be restored to our first love. What about others? Have you obeyed the Christ, the risen Christ? Have you been obedient to his commandments? He wants you to hear his good news. That's the good news about his death, burial, and resurrection. He wants you to unite that with faith. He wants you to believe in him. He wants you to repent of your sins because all of us have sinned, and except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 13 and verse 3. He wants us to confess him as Lord, as the very Son of God, for what he is that was proven by the resurrection. And he commands us to be baptized into him for the remission of our sins. If you need to do that this morning, you need to do it right now. Whatever your need is, spiritually speaking, if you need to respond, won't you do so while we stand and while we sing?